Morning. Good morning. It, you look so good out there. You really do on a beautiful Sunday morning to just spend this time with, with you and to, to share. Um, I love that last song uh, that the praise team does, you know, that last chorus, you know, no fear in life, no, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. And, and I hope that you take that message and, and the music and let it just resonate through, through your soul all week long. We've been doing a series that's kind of coming to, en to the end, this whole issue of, of heaven and hell. It's kind of, as best as I can, this is kind of that fire and brimstone kind of sermon that, to share what I think about our destiny and, and the choices that we have to make. And I don't know what you've been thinking about the last couple of weeks as we've taken this journey together, whether maybe it's helped you to think through some things, maybe it's taken away some fear, given you some inspiration. And part of what I've really been interested in doing is trying to cut through a lot of the stereotypes that we often get over the years. Maybe you've had some image or some experience of fire and brimstone, of what that's really like, of, of the fear and anxiety about the end of life issues. And we've entitled kind of this series about what happens in life after life? Because we all have that destiny. We, we may kind of hide it for a while. We may pretend that it doesn't really exist for us, but that happens to all of us at some point. And so we've titled this week, we're talking about that song. Uh, that song has been resonating in my mind all week from Mercy Me, and I know that many of you have heard it. I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like. Will, will I dance for you, Jesus, or stand, will I be able to stand in your presence? Will I sing hallelujah, or will I be able to speak at all? What will it be like in that moment? And I wanted to spend this last time of thinking about our journey, about what would it be like to be in God's kingdom? What challenges does it face and, and what opportunities does it, whenever we talk about heaven, does something well up inside of you and give you that aha moment of if only it were true, if only it were possible for somebody like me. I think though some of, us time, some of the times we have a lot of stereotypes that hold us back. Some things that we've heard or seen or read in the past and we've talked about some of the stereotypes that we have, particularly about hell. And sometimes people think about hell as, as an eternal torture chamber that God has created to keep those people that have lived bad lives and keep them down and, and lock the key. And, and if you have that image that hell is an eternal torture chamber, then most people will flee or they will run from something like that. Whatever you're afraid of, you will run from it. That's just natural human nature. The problem is you're not running towards anything. You're just fleeing a painful experience or something that you think is wrong. You're not necessarily running towards God. You're just running away from something that you think is bad. You will flee from your nightmares. And that usually produces two things in most people. For most people, if they have a fear of something in their life, they will either deny its existence, they'll pretend it's not gonna happen, they'll pretend that they're going to live forever, and that end-of-life issues don't really apply to us. We don't really think about it. So they live in a sense of denial. And we, as Western people, very technological, savvy kind of people, we tend to depend more on our technology to save us. We look for the next technology wave that'll make life better, that will fill that emptiness. We deny that we have a spiritual side to us. We will deny the reality of life or the other side of it, we will often become so distracted that we don't have to think about it. 
We all know deep down inside that we're really not going to live forever, but we don't think that right now we have to really worry about it. We will always have more time. And so we've become so busy, we fill up our calendar. We're, we're actually too busy to pay attention to end of life issues. We don't need to think about that. That's down the road. We'll have plenty of time, and now is not the time. The problem is, is those habits become ingrained. And as we live on, we never really think it's about us. And so we get this image that God is going to throw all of the bad people into hell and lock the key. And so we create in our mind this idea that God has got some kind of a standard. And we talked about this early on, some kind of a finger that says, if you are not this tall, you do not get in. And so we spend our times trying to figure out if we are good enough. Why is it we hide some of the junk that's in our lives? We don't really like to be open. We don't like to talk about the problems that we have because we don't like to admit to ourselves that we're not as clean as we like to believe. Hell is not a place where God throws all the bad people. It's a place that I think hell is not punishment for being good enough, but a place of eternal self-love. It's that place where when all of your life you've decided, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I like church services the way I like. I like them to flow a nice way. I like to hear the music that I like because I like it my way. C.S. Lewis, and you're hearing a lot of C.S. Lewis lately. C.S. Lewis once said that heaven is a place where you say to God, thy will be done. Hell is the place where God says to you, thy will be done. You've always wanted it your way. You've always said my way or the highway, and finally there comes a moment of decision where God says then, thy will be done. It's a place where you get to live eternally for your needs and yours alone. Here's the problem. Everybody else is living for themselves as well. No relationship can exist between two people bent on self-love. And that within itself creates a hell. But there's also the other side of the coin, and we talked about this, about how sometimes when people think about heaven, they think about it in terms of a pleasure factory, where God is going to give you everything you ever wanted, about how your table will be full and overflowing, everybody will have their own mansion, it will be like earth, only you will have more stuff. You will have more storage sheds to clean out. You will have more places to park your car. And so we often make heaven in our own image. It's about what we get out of it. But if you think of it in those terms, isn't hell, isn't heaven just a more glorious way for you to love yourself? What is it you get out of it? And churches have often been doing this, talking about what God will do for you if you go to church and if you give a certain amount to the church or a certain amount of money. Look at all of the things that you can earn, the things that you can have. But Jesus didn't seem to see it that way. Jesus, when he came, he lived a completely different life that shocked everybody. And so we kind of talked about heaven is not a reward for doing all of the right things, for following the right path, but by being rehumanizing according to Jesus. When Jesus came, one of the things that shocked most people that were around him is that people could not understand why was he hanging out with these kind of people? Doesn't Jesus know that we don't hang out with those kind of people? But Jesus saw them in a different light. He, he heard their cry. He saw them differently. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, these people, their hearts have become hard. They're no longer able to hear with their ears or see with their eyes, because if they could, then they would know to come and I would heal them. They have lost their humanity. And so heaven is not about all the things that you get, it's about who you become. Jesus, somebody once said, Jesus did not come to get you into heaven. Jesus came to get heaven into you. 
to change the way you are from the inside. Not open the door so that this pleasure factory is now open to you, but to change who you are, how you see the world, and especially how you see yourself. Now, in case you're ever wondering, well, then how does anybody ever fully understand or get into God's kingdom? Again, C.S. Lewis said that no soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek find and those who knock, it will be opened. If you are truly inter interested and in searching and seeking for God's best, it will always be available to you. God will make it available. The question that comes is whether we truly want God's presence. We're truly ready for what he has in store. And so I want us to go back and say, let's imagine the kingdom. Let's imagine what the Bible really tells us about life after life. And maybe there's that moment in our lives where you get, catch that aha moment. Have you ever had that experience where maybe you're driving along and maybe it's that beautiful sunset? You know, I have these moments when I show up in church on Sunday morning is just as I come over, the valleys in this area are kind of filled with fog and the fog is just beginning to lift and, and the peaks are just beginning to come out of the fog. They're becoming awake and all of the fog, and it's, a, it's an amazingly beautiful scene and you kind of drive up and you kind of say, and God was there. It's that aha moment, that recognition that God has been moving. What happens when we catch those beautiful moments, those moments of real joy, when we say something special is happening in our world, those moments of heaven? So this morning, I want to ask you to do three things. In our time together, I want, after we've kind of finished our series on heaven, I want you to know something about heaven. I, I want you to feel something different, and I want you to do something. Now, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what the Bible tells us, and I want you to think about changing something in your life, about building something in your life that's going to be different. Paul in, in uh, Colossians, the third chapter, he says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. How does your life, how does your day-to-day -day activities change if you think more about our destiny, about, more about the people that we are becoming, about the kingdom that God is calling us into? And so this morning I want to share this passage from Revelation. And I want to talk a little bit about how Jesus is inviting us into a different kind of world. Beginning with Revelations on the 21st chapter. Listen to the words and think about how, what do they evoke within you? What kind of feelings do they awaken? John writes, Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues. And he spoke to me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels, and on the gates were the name of 12 tribes of the son of Israel were inscribed. On the east were three gates, and on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the walls of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Its light will be the, will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. 
They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and its servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more, and they will need no light for the, for, of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. So in our story, in our revelation from John, John uses such imagery in order to evoke a sense of awe, a sense of transcendence. And there's three things that I think primarily we can take away from this. Three things that I want us to focus on in our own lives that we ought to be focusing on all the time. The first thing is there's something that I want you to think about. I want it to resonate in your head. I want you to chew on it. I want you to take it home and say, could that really be true? Is it really possible? And if it is true, what response do I have to it? I want you to feel something. I don't want you to just say religion is cold and logical but I want you to know that it is personal and profound. I want you to think and I want it to well up and I want you to be inspired. I want you to kind of capture your breath and take your breath away. I want you to be so enamored and so inspired by what God could do and what God is doing that you say, how can I not be involved? Every time I hear about the ministries of this church, whether it's sack pack that's feeding children, or whether it's Kids Hope, giving kids that are struggling with difficult home lives a second chance, I often think, how can you not be involved in something like this? It's got to inspire you. It's got to turn in your stomach until it becomes real and personal. Because it's only when you say it is true and it's real that you actually put your hands to the plow. Otherwise, we're always focused on what's in it for me. The first thing that I want us to focus on is the reality from John's description that heaven, I want you to know that heaven is for real. Heaven isn't what Karl Marx once said. Religion is the opium of the masses. It was created to make people happy. John's description is beyond our understanding. And isn't that the way we should expect it? Shouldn't heaven and God's kingdom be far different than anything that you can imagine? In 1 Corinthians, John is writing, he says, No eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind can conceive the things that God has prepared for those who love him. How many times do we often say, what will it be like when we get there? Will I have a house of my own? What will the streets be paved with? John's revelation is so beyond our description. He tries to use human words to describe things that are beyond our understanding. Let me give you a for, exa for example. Uh, let's say, for example, we had a, a mother that was here and, and she had a child that was growing within her. And if we could have a conversation with that child and we could ask, how is it where you are? And the child said, it is great in here. I'm safe and I'm warm. I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. I get three meals a day and I don't even have to work for it. She takes me wherever I want to go. It doesn't get any better than this. And we said, how would you communicate to that child about getting born. He said, well, how would you like to be born, to go through the trauma of birth and, and come to my world? Well, no, I don't want to go there. That's a scary place. I love it here because I'm so secure. How could you tell the child, well, let me tell you about t-ball. Let me tell you about autumn days. Let me tell you about going sled riding or birthday parties. Let me tell you about going to the beach with a family. 
How could you tell the child? He has no experience of the things that we know. How could you want to stay there forever? And sometimes people give up on our world. And I think that God created human birth the way it is in order to give us an example. You are not dying into oblivion. You are being birthed into a new life. When Nicodemus came to see Jesus and Jesus is trying to explain to him about how to see the world differently, he said, I don't understand this. And Jesus said, you have to be born again. You have to be birthed a second time. When we understand the fullness of heaven, it's so beyond our wildest description. Recently, we've seen, um, and, and Thomas Merton said, if you find God with ease, perhaps it is not God you have found. So often we want to describe what heaven is like. Because when we can describe it, when we can confine it, then you can actually choose, maybe I want it, maybe I don't. But what happens if it's beyond your description? Recently, we've had images like this come in from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is just one galaxy. The beauty and the majesty, the danger, is beyond our description. It is so immense that we cannot wrap our head around it. The number of galaxies and the expanse is so... Tr Why is it so big? Because God is so big and bigger beyond. We cannot comprehend. So often we want to boil God down into a formula, into an equation. What God is inviting you to do is experience something that is beyond your experience. And so we have to recognize that our minds simply cannot wrap their head around God's beauty and God's glory of the kingdom. And so what will we do? We often give up on it. Well, if I can't describe it, then I, it can't be true. If, if I can't understand it, if God hasn't explained it to me, then it must not be true. What does Jesus tell his disciples? You have to trust me. Trust in God, trust also in you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back that where I am, you may be also. There's not a lot of description in our language that helps us to understand the glory of that kind of a kingdom. I also want you to feel something. I want you to feel that you were made for heaven. This is the time of year where everybody's going on vacation. We're reconnecting with our family. We're going to the beach. We're doing things to reconnect ourselves to what's really important. And if you've ever had that moment where you're, maybe you're, you're at the beach, and I, by the way, I love the slides that they were using this morning of the beach rolling in, and there's that moment of serenity, of peace, and you say, I was made for this. This is what I've been longing for my whole life. These sacred moments, these moments of joy, these moments of transcendence. C.S. Lewis said, heaven is that remote music that we are born remembering. It's like a song in the back of your mind that you're constantly haunted by its melody. It all, always is speaking to you about something deeper, about who you are and about what you were made for. What John is trying to do in his revelation is not give you a step-by-step -step description of what heaven is going to be like, but to evoke an emotion an aha, a wonder. In our technology-centered lives, we have lost the mystery of wonder. We have lost, to a large extent, the beauty of going out on a starry night and seeing the Milky Way. When was the last time you can honestly say you were out among the stars and you could say, this is the glory. This is how beautiful it can be. How often have we lost just the mystery of joy, of that sacred moment that speaks to us. I want you to know one thing about yourself. You were made for joy. You were made for those moments of transcendence, of wonder, of beauty. How many times have I heard new parents when a child is born and in that one little moment you have that little bundle of joy and you kind of that sacred moment of a new life has been born and you kind of get that aha moment. 
and you recognize that those moments are often fleeting and passing by and you look and say I was made for something more something sacred you were also made for glory no matter what's been going on in your life you were made to live eternally you are beyond your own recognition of what you you are now God is creating something new you were made for heaven you were made for God's glory that's why C.S. Lewis he says if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is I was made for another world he says in our own world whenever we feel hungry it's because there is food we need food when we're thirsty, it's because water exists. If there's a sense of joy or a sense of longing in our hearts, it's because we were made for something else. That's why Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. There's something that is stirring, drawing us ever closer to God's kingdom. I also want you to know and most of all, I'd like you to do the following. To live less out of habit and more out of intent. Most of our lives, we're just going through the motions. Tomorrow you'll get up, you'll get showered, you'll go to work, you'll come home, you'll eat, you'll go to bed. So that the next day you can get up and you can get showered and go to work. And you can come home and go. We go through the routines. And so much of our life is going through the routines. And we never really stop to think, what am I becoming? Who am I? What is my destiny? What is it that I want out of my life in the time that I'm here on earth? What is it that God is calling me to be and to do? John's revelation reminds us of a kingdom that is beyond our description. And he said, it's waiting for you. The challenge is, is whether you will push through and receive it. The first thing that I want us to think about is there are no ordinary people. In order for us to live with intention, we have to recognize that we are not just getting by. We are not just ordinary people going through an ordinary life. You are not ordinary. You already know this. You already know that your fingerprint, your facial expressions, your style is unlike anybody that has ever been created before or since in the history of the world. You are one of a kind. You are not ordinary but not just here and now. You are also somebody that is going to live eternally. It is not with mortals that you interact, but with immortals, people that will become even more heavenly by your presence, or perhaps more devilish, but they will live forever. And John says, Paul says, we plant only a seed, but what it becomes is unknown to us, but it will be far more than just a seed. You are not just an ordinary soul. We also have to recognize that what you believe is what you will become. What you believe about yourself, you ultimately become. So often we face challenges and difficulties. And maybe I don't know what this, these messages about heaven have really resonated with you. But the idea that Paul says is because I have been called heavenward in Christ, because I have a destiny, I can press on. I can press on through anything. If you kind of say this is all there is, this is as good as it gets, then whenever tragedy comes, people just fall apart. But Paul said in the midst of my trials, I press on because I believe I was made for something more. The, ch the challenge that I would ask is, are you made for something more or have you settled for second best? Have you said, I'm just going to settle for the bare minimum? Or do you believe that you were made for something more? What you believe about yourself is what you ultimately become. And finally, I want you to impact this world in light of the next. I want you to leave a legacy. I, I want you to know at the end of your life that your time on this planet was not without effect. That your time and your talents, that the miracle that happened at your birth changed lives. And that when you look back on your life on the other side, when you have been birthed into the new world, 
you'll recognize my life made a real difference. I want to make a difference in light of the kingdom that is coming. In Matthew chapter 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. You have been given a light, a hope, a promise, a glimpse of what heaven can be like. Matthew, Jesus now says, now go out and share that light. Bring others who are still too afraid, who have given up, bring them into the hope. John Faulkner once said, but I have one candle of life to burn and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light. I would rather burn out my life bringing joy to others than to ask constantly what's in it for me. Do I have enough? In your own journey of faith, as we continue to make an impact, your life is going to make an impact. The question is, is it for good or bad? Are you making a positive difference? Are you learning to grow and to change? And so let me leave you with this final thought. Heaven, faith will open the door. Belief that Jesus can and that Jesus will will open the door, but only your love will help you push through it. Only your desire for more will help you overcome the hurdles and the obstacles. We offer this morning an opportunity to get involved and to begin to experience the newness of life. We're celebrating this morning Curtis's baptism. The, the Celtic Christians used to believe that the sacraments were a thin place where our world, our physical world, begins to blend and begins to merge with the heavenly, where common elements like water or juice and bread are infused with deep spiritual significance. Lives are changed and awakened in new possible ways. Curtis is taking that step into a whole new spiritual world. And I wonder, as he shares this time with us, as we get to celebrate this joyful moment, we were made for moments like this. Does it stir an awakening within you of what God can do in your life? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we are able to celebrate this sacred moment of your presence, your hope, and your future. In Jesus' name, amen.